It is Wednesday, September 11th, 2019. 9-11. 18 years after the events of 9-11, um, when, of course, uh, we were under attack. Two planes in the World Trade Center, one at the Pentagon, one crashing later in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, but even after 18 years, it seems like the every year, uh, the memories get more intense. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd share them with you, if you don't mind. This won't take long. But um, as, a, as a tribute to those lives that were lost and people who are still struggling with it, I thought um, it made sense just not to forget. This is my story. Uh, we were in California at the time. Um and living in California in the valley, uh, I wasn't working, uh, so I was uh, at home that day. My wife, uh, our son, was there. Our son was only five years old at the time. And a friend of ours, Brian, calls on the phone, says, uh, if you don't have the TV on, turn it on. You won't believe what's happening in New York. So we did, and we didn't. What we saw was um, just what many of you saw. It's incredible. Uh, one tower on fire. Soon after, uh, another tower attacked. We didn't quite know what to make of it, like you, like yourself. Uh, but it, it felt like something horrible. And it turned out that way. Uh, again, my son was only five years old at the time. My wife was, was frightened for his safety and ours, because even though we were in California, we didn't quite know what was going to happen next. Um, so like many mothers, she kept uh, she kept him home from school that day. Uh, I didn't quite know what to do at that point. Uh, I did, got a phone call almost immediately uh, and found out that a, a relative who will go unnamed for purposes of this conversation was in New York and, in fact, worked at the World Trade Center and was missing. They didn't know if she had gone to work that morning. Uh, they hadn't heard from her. It was now shortly after 9 o'clock, well past the time of the, the first attack, uh, I believe, on the North Tower. And so um, we feared for her life. We didn't know what was going on. Meanwhile, uh, I began calling people, uh, uh, talking around to some colleagues. Um, as it turns out, we, I had just left uh, a job that I had had for about two years at the Orange County News Channel in Orange County, California. Uh, I was an anchor there. And um, uh, through a series of misdeeds, the ownership of that uh, of that storied station. It was a great station, Orange County News, News Channel. We called it OCN. Uh, I had closed down. It closed down just that Thursday. And so a staff of about three dozen people, including many young good journalists, were all out in the street. We were we had just left that Thursday. So here we were on um that was a Tuesday, September eleventh, two thousand one. Here we are on Tuesday watching this event unfold on TV. And as any reporter will tell you, something happens, I got to know more about it. And I got to tell you about it. It's like my mission in life. It's probably why I'm doing this now. And so um, we were talking, we're back and forth on the phone. We couldn't believe it. There was a story and we realized that once things unfolded and we knew this was an attack on the U.S., it... Um, it was clear that this would be one of the biggest stories of our lifetime, certainly probably the 21st century, this new 21st century. And so we were, we were heartbroken, we were anxious, we were pissed off because we couldn't get to uh, take part in, in, in reporting and documenting this event. Uh, so we tried to figure out other ways to do it. 2001, there was none of this. No Facebook, no YouTube, um, 
nothing to do online like like we can do today. So I called um, some of my old co uh, old colleagues at uh, CNN and um, just asked around because I knew this was what we call an all hands on deck situation. Uh, you're gonna need some help. So I called an old producer. Said, "Yeah, we we could use the help. So come on in." And I came in and um, and they put me to work. Not as a reporter, but as a producer. They had plenty of reporters that day, but what they needed was producers and people to log tapes. And logging tapes is a very simple operation. All you're doing is watching tapes, looking at footage, raw footage that's coming in. Um, but much of the footage that day was um, frightening, to say the least. The people walking around the streets, um, ghost-like, covered with ash, dust. Uh, some of the footage, some of it remarkably close to the towers. When the towers dropped, they had f cameras everywhere. And probably the most disturbing for me was two tapes worth of... Uh, shots of people jumping from the towers. Um, the photographers would sometimes follow them all the way down. Other times they, they couldn't. It was just difficult to do. Uh, but even if they did not follow them down, what you heard was the <coughs> loud, almost undescribable noise of something hitting something. And we learn later that these were people either hitting the ground or hitting part of the facade of the building as they um, as they jumped for their lives because there was nothing else they could do. And I um I watched that logging in is uh, the process of making notations where this footage exists so they can either use it or in this case set it aside which they had to because uh it was just too graphic for television so that's what i uh, concerned myself with for most of that day that i was there uh time went by two hours still had not heard from my um relative they were anxiously of course waiting for her, looking for her. Um, and then at about th three and a half hours, uh, the word came that she had contacted uh, my people in Boston and said that she was fine, but that she had quite a story to tell. Turns out that she gets to work every day, roughly at about 8.30, maybe a little past, the first tower was hit at about 8.44, I think. So she, between 8.30, 8.45, she can get to work. On on certain days, she'll stop, pick up a coffee and a donut or coffee and a bagel. Doesn't do it every day, but on this particular day, she did. So she stopped. She got off the train, which is underneath the, or used to be underneath the World Trade Center, um, got her coffee and bagel. And that time... Uh, that she spent getting that coffee and bagel was just enough time to delay her entrance into the building so that when she got in the elevator, as she's going up in the elevator, that first tower was hit. And if you know anything about that World Trade Center and you've heard some of the stories that people tell, if you only go up a certain, uh, up to a certain floor in the tower, something happens. Uh, something happens to compromise the towers of the elevator. The elevators will default back into the lobby, which is exactly what happened. So instead of going all the way up to her floor, I'm not quite sure where it was, uh, the elevator, as soon as the building was hit, uh, turned around, defaulted back to the, um, the lobby. Uh, there were people in the lobby ordering her, urging her, screaming at her to get out and other people to get out and get away, which she uh, actually did, of course, right away. And, and more so, so than that, she, t she tells the story these, these, uh, to this day. <laughs> she looked up and knew that that wasn't the place to be. Uh, so she, uh, 
she hightailed it out of there. Like many people covered in dust, uh, lost her shoes, you know, possessions, what have you. But she kept moving and pretty much walked all the way home and, um, and lived to tell about it. And we're grateful. Not many people were that lucky. 3,000 in all. 2,000 people since then have died um, from related illness, cancer-causing uh, uh, illness. And um, as I said, 18 years later, it remains as clear today as it was on that day, at least for me. What I'm struck by at this 18-year point is the fact that there's a whole generation that has grown up not able to say, I know where I was on that day, or I have a memory, I have a feeling that I've carried forward about what happened to me that day, how I felt, the people I've lost, the people I still know that still suffer from that. And so for them, it's history. It's history. Like for many of us, or for many people of a certain age, World War II and other events such as that are just history. So on this 18th anniversary of the most horrific attack on U.S. soil ever, I, um, I share the story with you in an effort to uh, pass on an oral history like many other people have. It's just my story, but it's part of the whole fabric of stories that people will carry forward. And leaving it on this platform, as far as I know, it will stay there um, for some time. And so I urge you as well to uh, tell your story. Push it forward. Pay it forward, as it were. Uh, particularly for the generation now that has grown up not knowing the horrific details of that day and only having to learn it from their parents, their friends, their schools, and people like you and me. 9-11, 18 years later. Never forget. <laughs>